Good afternoon. My name is John Herbst. I run the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. We've got a treat for you this afternoon. We have a really stellar panel to talk to you about investing in Ukraine. Um, I will not give you their bios. Uh, you have them in front of you. Uh, my job is to get this thing started quickly. Uh, you can follow us at AC Eurasia, um, number sign, Future Ukraine. And with that, I will turn this over to uh, Miroslav Gungadze, who will be the moderator for today's event. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I know that we are streaming this live and you can tweet as well. And uh, I have the hashtag, uh, hashtag future Ukraine at AC Eurasia. So you can, um, you can tweet. Um, one, two, like as a, as a news anchor, as a news reporter, I have to, I feel obligated to uh, give you some uh, news. And today uh, was two important news in Ukrainian development. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the the son of uh, uh, of interior minister of Ukraine was arrested and charged uh, uh, with some corruption issues, as well as uh, one of the former head of investment administration in Ukraine was um, extradited from Panama and charged as well. So I think this is positive news for Ukraine because it's we can see that there is some development in fighting corruption in Ukraine. And we would be talking about investment in Ukraine. And this is the part of, very important part of, of uh, a future uh, cleaning, the <coughs> future of cleaning the system in Ukraine. So after the revolution of dignity in Ukraine, um, Ukraine made, made a lot of uh, efforts and went through some very painful um, uh, reforms to stabilize, stabilize its economy and achieve uh, moderate growth. And Ukrainians um, uh, want to be part of Europe. They feel that they are Europeans. However, uh, this is not enough to catch up with uh, European uh, neighbors. Such a breakthrough uh, can only be achieved through uh, attracting investment in Ukraine. Um, so here's one, once again, we are um, looking at two wars that Ukraine is fighting. One is, is the war on Donbass in eastern Ukraine, a real war uh, with uh, aggressive Russia. And uh, second is the war uh, or, or internal uh, fight with corruption. Um, our distinguished panel uh, today will help us to answer uh, the questions of what should um, be done to turn Ukraine uh, into a successful uh, European economy and democracy and market economy, as uh, Aslan uh, put it uh, like a few years ago in his book. So um, I will uh, first uh, turn to uh, Paula Dobryansky, Ambassador Paula Dobryansky, who worked on Ukraine for many, many years as a person, as a part of the family, as your family. You follow Ukraine very closely for many years. So um, the question is, uh, what is the impact of two Ukraine's uh, major challenges, uh, the Russian aggression and corruption, have on a country's investment climate? How do you see it? Okay, well, thank you very much. And let me also thank the Atlantic Council for holding this forum. I think it's very timely. And not only that, it's very timely, but actually I know that we've had sessions, I'm looking at Anders and then Ambassador Herbst over there, sessions that have looked at the political economic situation, but not so much exactly this issue of investment. So just uh, congratulations on that. Um, the question that you asked, when you look at both the aggression and also the issue of corruption, the, the, the very quick answer is yes, it does have an impact. How can actually, starting with the first one, when you have aggression, 
uh, in the country, uh, in eastern Ukraine, and you have a conflict that has been ensuing and ceasefires that have been broken, I think it's hard for any country under similar circumstances to be able to grow its economy, to take the kind of stabilization measures that one would expect. But I'm going to come back to also saying what Ukraine, even under these circumstances, has done. So first, yes, of course, it's a core factor. Let's just look at the aggression. What's the issue? The issue is, as you know, that businesses, when businesses seek to invest, they look for some predictability. They look for some kind of consistency. They look for um, uh, an environment which they believe is going to be stable. So, as I mentioned, the fact that you have <coughs> ceasefire after ceasefire that has been broken, quite frankly, that does breed uh, uncertainty. It also breeds another factor in consideration, which is not fair to Ukraine. And that is the fact that you have millions of people who are internally displaced in Ukraine, who want to go back, who want to make those areas vibrant, who want their jobs, who want to be able to vote, and who have not been able to do so. So that's another factor that Ukraine as a country has been trying to, to, uh, to grapple with. The issue of corruption uh, is also um, uh, clearly with regard to investment. It's a challenge because businesses come in, you want transparency. You also want consistency in terms of laws, and especially not just laws only being on the book, but law, legal enforcement and law enforcement. You don't want to have to be put in a situation where you're being uh, challenged, uh, challenged in the sense of, of maybe you want a license and uh, you, uh, someone is seeking a bribe from you and that delays the getting of the license and you don't want to go down that path. So candidly speaking, the answer is yes, it does pose a challenge. And as I repeat, whether we were talking about Ukraine today or by the way, any other country, I think it would be a challenge. Having said that, let me give you the other side of the ledger given all of the circumstances that Ukraine has had to deal with and where it has been able to progress under these very direct challenges. I was struck by, if you happen to look at the Atlantic Council's website, and I only happen to look at it just fortuitously, and I found Diane Francis, who is a well-known Canadian journalist. She has an article posted on the website. And the article uh, extracts a public interview that Prime Minister, Ukrainian Prime Minister Groisman gave up in Canada. And the actual context of the forum or the interview was looking at business investment. And they were querying him to talk about, well, what is the situation? I have to say that I, I feel that there were certain things that he said that are definitely worth registering here. Some things he said and some things that are also known about Ukraine. One of the things that he mentioned specifically is a law that is being discussed right now that where uh, basically the police will not investigate economic crimes. And he was discussing that. Uh, there's a debate going on as to whether that will be independent or whether that will be attached uh, some way to uh, the government. Um, basically, he was advocating that it should be independent and that when these kinds of challenges come forward, that they need to be done by financial investigators, the NABU, uh, as well as the anti-corruption uh, court, which, as I said, he calls for it being independent. Basically, that these kinds of investigations should not be undertaken by public uh, service uh, members or enforcement, that it has to be separate. It's one step that has been advocated. We could debate and discuss whether this has advantages or disadvantages. But I think the fact that there's a recognition that there's a problem here and there's an attempt to try to look for a way forward I see that as a good sign. I think it's also worth uh, mentioning that in this article by Diane Francis, she cites, for example, the October Helsinki Commission report on corruption in Ukraine. 
I mention that to you as a document because OSCE is very well respected. It steps back, it takes stock of, of uh, uh, developments uh, uh, across the board for OSCE, me OSCE members. And here, it itemized a number of the key areas in which uh, the government has taken some very significant actions uh, where they've eliminated predation, such as the restoration of Nazi gas and natural <coughs> gas market, the restructuring of uh, banks, also new drug uh, procurement procedures. Uh, there were also some post that fraud, post that collection changes, amendments that have been made, in addition to reforms undertaken in the health area, education area, and also one of the very significant areas, pension, which all of these are out there. That doesn't mean that everything is done. In fact, let me share with you areas that have not been, um, um, uh, uh, if you will, uh, have not witnessed uh, such um, uh, change that has been codified and is being implemented. And that is local and regional self-government uh, here, reforms in that area, uh, public adjudication, the judiciary, I mentioned law enforcement agencies, and then privatization and land ownership. In going back to Groisman and his remarks, one of the questions he was asked was, well, wouldn't it make sense to really go full, full, full swing on privatization? That privatization could really be of great benefit to Ukraine. The answer, of course, is yes to that. And he mentioned a commitment to what he called a demonopolization of uh, uh, industries in, in, in Ukraine. In other words, addressing the question that was targeted to him about how do you deal with oligarchs. So again, that's what he has said. You, one needs to see the action undertaken in that very, very crucial area. Finally, um, I will uh, just say that when you look at the overall microeconomic um, situation, I think that most would say that it has stabilized in Ukraine, definitely from the couple years past where there was a concern as to what was going to happen. But I think that most would say it's fragile. And why is it fragile? It's fragile because of going back to Miroslava's first point, you know, the, the, the tumultuous situation which Ukraine is confronted with. The uh, aggression on the border, uh, the internally displaced persons, um, the issue of corruption, and ensuring that there are not only laws, but there's enforcement, and there are measures that are put into place that are in, in practice. So one could argue that there's a fragility there. I will say that when you evaluate all things considered, Ukraine has done remarkably well under these challenging circumstances in attracting investment, particularly from Europe, I would say, and looking at a number of the cases um, of those who have invested in Europe. But a final note is I would inject in this, and that's a political one. We need to be cognizant of the fact that we are approaching a political cycle. The presidential elections, which are slated for uh, 2019, I believe March is what's discussed, and no less the parliamentary elections. Same thing in terms of the target of going into 2019. So that backdrop poses some uncertainty. Uh, but you can also argue it poses some impetus, too, in terms of meeting these reforms, getting them in place in order to garner public support behind a greater certainty, predictability, and stability. Um, so the ledger is a tough one. It's confronted with very difficult situation. But I would submit that uh, when you look at it, it's remarkable the progress that has been made under very, very challenging circumstances. Thank you, Paula. And actually, you mentioned that OEC report, and, and that, that report actually mentioned those successes as well as a very positive development. And I would uh, probably turn to Betsy uh, in this case. And uh, uh, some of the Ukrainian um, uh, sectors uh, actually showed uh, resilience. Uh, under these uh, circumstances, let's say IT sector or agricultural sector. Um, 
So um, my question is, uh, what should uh, Ukraine uh, do to attract investment and build uh, on these existing successes? Thank you, and I too want to thank the Atlantic Council for hosting all of us. Um, so I was recently in Ukraine for the seventh meeting of the Trade and Investment Council, which is a bilateral forum that USTR has with the government of Ukraine. I say USTR, actually, we include all of our learned colleagues from across the government. And the intent is to look at, in large part, this question, how do we improve the investment environment um, and make it more attractive? Um, and we discussed many of the themes that we are talking about today. One of our recurring themes, and actually some that Paolo touched on, and those are predictability, transparency, and the rule of law. And those are three issues that we push consistently. And we all know that there are a lot of issues, a lot of steps that Ukraine could take, needs to take to improve the investment environment, corruption, privatization, as Paula mentioned. Um, I think that it is, I, it reminds me of a phrase actually that I learned in that region, and it refers to eating the elephant one bite at a time. It's a big issue, but you got to start somewhere. So I, I want to talk about two bites and sort of at the risk of getting a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's helpful to try and drill down and work with the government of Ukraine on steps that we think that they need to take. So the first issue is IPR, and this goes to your point about the IT sector, that we have talked for years with Ukraine about the need to improve the enforcement and protection of intellectual property rights. Um, and we, we talk about IPR not just for the financial benefit of rights holders, not just for the benefit of US rights holders, but for Ukrainian rights holders, for those investors, the IT inventors, and the artists. We also talk about it because it has a wide-ranging impact. And in many ways, it goes to, it sort of becomes a bellwether for the investment and business environment overall. Now, there is some good news that they did recently pass a law on cinematography um, and that it provides some good, good steps. I will spare you some of the gory details, but it has introduced some predict predictability for rights holders, that there is a law that they can turn to to use to stop the illegal download of movies and of music, and so that their property, their intellectual property, can be protected. It remains to be seen how this is going to be enforced. Um, Clearly, that is where that element, the rule of law, comes into play. They have a good law on the books. Are they going to vigorously enforce it to demonstrate, again, that the government of Ukraine is committed to the rule of law? Progress is slower in some other areas that have been of perennial interest to us. Um, unlicensed software, uh, according to industry, about 82% of computers in Ukraine are running on unlicensed software. I don't have current numbers for the percentage of government computers that are on unlicensed software, but it's way up there. And part of the reason why we can't get those numbers is because it's hard to count. There have been some issues. You'd think it'd be kind of easy to count one, two, three, four, five. Not, not so, and so we don't have really accurate numbers, but it is particularly distressing when there is a high percentage of computers running on unlicensed software in the Ministry of Economic Development and Trade. The actual ministry that is supposed to be supporting, enforcing, protecting intellectual property rights. So that's an issue that we continue to push. It's also worth noting that that is a very important element for another issue that we've talked on, talk, touched on, and that is that unlicensed software is much easier to hack, much more susceptible to cyber attacks. And um, we all know the possibility of that. 
Um, third particular issue is collective management organizations. Um, and these are the groups that collect royalties when music is played on the radio, when movies are shown, and gives that money to rights holders. And the system in Ukraine is in need of serious reform. Royalties are collected sometimes. Sometimes they're collected, and even less times, they're actually paid out. So it is a system that is quite um, broken. Uh, it needs some reform. There is a lot of corruption there. The United States, the EU, WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization have all tried to work with the government of Ukraine to improve this regime and to draft legislation. And time and again, the government of Ukraine has walked away from it. And even now, there is legislation, draft legislation in Kyiv that would dramatically improve the system, bring transparency, bring predictability to this regime. And again, my understanding is they're about to walk away from it. And it just sort of re, um, it suggests that there are other forces at hand that don't want the regime fixed. And that's, again, where it sort of becomes a bellwether, that if they can't fix that system, what else can't they fix? What, where is the control of those who would rather just collect the royalties and not distribute them? So we press reform in this area, and um, we try and work with Ukrainians to, again, taking it one bite at a time, and to give them specific steps in the hopes that it will send a broader message to the business. There's another subject I want to touch on that I don't think is discussed a whole lot, but I think really would improve the general investment environment, and that is the adoption of good regulatory practices. Um, so the central tenets of GRP are dispersed knowledge, broad participation, and a fulsome discussion. And all of those principles lead up to, lead to informed decision making so that the government can adopt good laws, good policies, those that are transparent and predictable, and then can be enforced contributing to the rule of law. So I, when I was in Kyiv, I also participated in some technical assistance programs on GRP. And um, came GRP? with GRP. GRP, good regulatory practices. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it seems to me that Ukraine and a number of the other former Soviet countries don't have as much of a strong, uh, strong tradition as we do um, of a participatory government as we know it. Um, I can say that sort of coming from a non-regulator, um, that maybe some of the regulatory elements of the US government are not as, they also love the participation. But it's, it seems to me that it's not as strong a tradition in Ukraine and that there are some reforms, some new systems that can be woven into the making of regulations and policy that would help increase the communication and making Ukraine a better investment environment. So in these programs, there clearly was a feeling on both the private and the public sector that they were frustrated by the system, but they wanted to improve it and they wanted to work together. Um, but the rules of engagement in Ukraine are, are challenging um, and lacking. So draft regulations and information is not always um, put out, it's not publicized on websites, and when it is, it's taken down very quickly. Shareholders' comments are not shared. So in the US system, if you comment on regulations, your comments are made public as well as everybody else's, so you know what everybody else is saying. 
there has to be an explanation of how the agency got <clears throat> to their conclusion so that you can see where, what information they're relying on and what they're not. And all of that goes to the transparency, and the transparency undercuts the opportunities for corruption. Back to one of our favorite problems. Um, so there, there are many steps like that that Ukraine can adopt to increase the transparency. Um, one other thing I noticed was a lack of a whole of government approach. There's an awful lot of stovepiping that there's agencies aren't always talking to each other an awful lot. In fact, even age offices within a ministry aren't talking with each other. So uh, I think I would recommend that they try and improve that communication so that there is transparency within the government of Ukraine as to what agencies are doing. Because I can tell you from my standpoint, I rely heavily on my interagency colleagues for their expertise. And I think that when you get all of those voices in a room, you have a better outcome. Um, so those are two specific areas that I think would help. Um, one sort of, I might say, substantive, one more procedural. But I, I think it helps to take that elephant one bite at a time, because just to look at the elephant, it's kind of daunting that we are working with Ukraine to try and eat it one bite at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. And uh, I saw a representative from Ukrainian embassy, and he's writing down your what you say. <laughs> he's, 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 heard, he's heard them so before. <laughs> 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 um, so, um, Again, I would turn back to successes because it, it's important to emphasize and uh, Ukraine were able to clean its banking sector and Ukraine were able to make some serious reform in energy sector and we have a representative uh, investor from energy sector and uh, and uh, we would probably call you a poster child of Ukrainian investment and th this late poster late, child poster child like the, the best <laughs> but it's usually <laughs> a good thing <laughs> okay. so uh, my question is uh, how were you able to succeed and uh, how do you see these major challenges um, uh, of Ukraine uh, affecting the investment climate okay um, so I will start uh, from the obstacles, from the negative side. You know, um, now um, my co previous colleagues discussed major country-wise obstacles for the investments. Obviously, Russian aggression, political crisis, etc. But from the business perspective, from the perspective of the companies that are working on the ground, uh, I would define obstacles in other priorities. First, I would put as a regulatory uh, predictability or unpredictability. And that, for our understanding, is the key issue that uh, impedes real investment in Ukraine. Obviously, you would have corruption and rule of law after that. And to support my view, I would give you a very good example. In our industry, in gas and oil industry, uh, in 2010, 2011, two major companies entered Ukraine, Exxon and Shell. They signed <coughs> huge uh, PSA's agreement with the government, uh, quite good for the government. With, and they, each of them should have invested at least two, three billion, uh, two, three hundred million dollars in Ukraine. So in uh, 2014, 2015, both of those companies exited the country. And to be honest, uh, war conflict was not the uh, key reason for their exit in the country. What happened during those years? At that time, the government and the parliament introduced several draconian measures in terms of our industry. First, it was draconian tax regime introduced, and then there were several governmental regulations that effectively um, uh, affected negatively the industry. So, and actually, it was the only period during the last eight years when private gas and oil production stopped growing. At that time, and or before those measures, uh, during 2014 and 15, there were only two industries in Ukraine that were growing, the agricultural sector and private gas production. Um, so this is a good example that um, uh, then unsustainable and unpredictable measures and 
policy of the government could affect, uh, could affect industry even more heavily than the major crisis. Another uh, position to support that view that I, before our meeting, I looked at the survey made by MIGA, general survey concerning investment uh, in other countries, and the one survey done by Dragon Capital in Ukraine. In both of those cases, uh, multinational companies and CEOs would say that uh, the key factor that stops them to invest in the countries which have got conflicts or to the countries which are in the post-conflict area is uh, unpredictable policy of the government. Only 15% of them said that the security issue is the key negative factor. So therefore, uh, today part of our job in Ukraine when we united, and, uh, when we united with our colleagues is to talk uh, to the government and work with them so that all of their measures would be predictable and foreseen that could you know, al allow the industry to develop. So um, why, why we are successful? Our company, Burisma, is one of the largest uh, uh, independent private gas production companies. We are a very good example of local investor. <coughs> Um, we are a good example of the company that most of our profit we reinvest in the country. And to say that if we look at the general, at the numbers and the tendency of figures in investments, let's divide it in the FDI, foreign direct investments, and local investments. Uh, local investments that are done internally in Ukraine or in, other, uh, in any other country, they are two, three times higher than FDI. So. But in Ukraine, FDI, starting from like 20 years ago, 60% of those FDIs w would come from Cyprus. Cyprus, Netherlands, and Russia. And only after that you would have countries like Germany, United States, So it's laundered money to Cyprus? Uh, what I'm saying is that in most cases, that was the money that was uh, taken from Ukraine, yes. Legally or illegally, it's uh, not the issue. No, and then reinvested. It is the issue. But <laughs> yeah. no, no, it, it is the issue, but what I'm saying, that I, the, the, my point is that in 2010 and 2011, the level of FDI to Ukraine was about seven and eight million, billion dollars. Uh, this year, it's only around three billion. Uh, so my point is that today, local investors in Ukraine like our company, everything that it's most of the part that uh, we earn, we reinvest in Ukraine, and other companies or, who would prefer to, you know, take the money out and then bring them back, they still, they still, um, uh, they still present the biggest portion of investment in the country. So first, what I would say that um, the government should work with these current local investors and, you know, help them to continue their job. And looking at these um, numbers, try to work with real Western foreign investors to really attract them, um, you know, uh, uh, and to you know to have like <coughs> pure and clean FDI investments. So what, what makes us different? We are not afraid. Uh, basically, we've got nowhere to go. You know, we are a local company. We're one of the biggest. We've got you know, thousands of employees. We're one of the uh, best and one of the top taxpayers, so we've got uh, no other options. But, but by our example, we're showing to foreigners that it's possible, it's doable, if you're brave enough. Actually, you are showing, and the question is, what are you recommending them to do to become a successful Loki? Um, first, um, to work consistently with the government and call for sustainability. And this is, you know, in, in today's terms, probably the key. And uh, try to unite in trade organizations that could altogether influence the decision makers with the government and help government to take the right decisions. Thank you so much. I think we will go back. Uh, we will talk more about, about, about sustainability, but I would like to pass to uh, Anders. Anders is following Ukraine forever. <laughs> I remember <laughs> myself. Uh, so um, following the Russian aggression, the Ukrainian economy um, had to look for market uh, elsewhere, uh, particularly um, in, in, uh, in Europe. 
Um, and uh, Ukraine signed deep and comprehensive agreement, trade agreement with, um, uh, with uh, European Union. So um, how successful uh, this effort was and how successful the European investment uh, and this agreement, how, how this agreement is working for Ukraine? Right now, not very. Uh, Ukraine's economy is probably growing by two and a half to three percent this year, uh, with a similar growth from uh, last year. This is not great. But when you ask why, and the big answer is uh, Russia, of course. And the Russian aggression comes in many forms. First, it's uh, seven percent of GDP that disappeared in uh, lost. Uh, Production, now 10% of GDP, because uh, that's the share of uh, occupied Donbass, and now it's completely cut off. Then, uh, foreign direct investment. We can see on the statistics that uh, real foreign direct investment has in the last uh, three years been about 1% of GDP. It used to be 4% of GDP. Uh, so this is a big change. You uh, wonder why I say real, because um, much of the so-called foreign direct investment is foreign banks that are transforming their loans that were given before mm -hmm. to their subsidiaries in Ukraine. They transform it to equity capital, and then it's called foreign direct investment, while no money uh, crosses the border. So that's uh, why it should not really be considered foreign direct investment. It's a bookkeeping uh, issue. So there we have 3% of GDP. That disappears because of uh, Russian war. And I would emphasize the war as the uh, direct uh, uh, reason. And then the third is uh, trade sanctions. Uh, trade with Russia used to be about 30% uh, of Ukraine's foreign trade. Now it's uh, down to 10, 12% of the total trade, but the trade is much smaller. Because uh, so three quarters of the trade with Russia has disappeared. And this is for, uh, because of very intentional Russian trade sanctions. It's also one third of Ukraine exports to Russia was military equipment. It's not very good to export military equipment to a country that you are in effect in war with. So this uh, has, uh, has uh, stopped. And uh, what we have continuing is sort of odd uh, uh, <coughs> tra uh, trade of, uh, for example, uh, the, the uh, tra uh, transit of gas through Ukraine. That's a service trade. Uh, you don't want to stop that. Oil transit. And uh, the trade in oil, for example, continues uh, normally. There are <laughs> relatively unpolitical parts of the trade, but while well, the political part has disappeared. Uh, so Russia has blocked food imports from Ukraine, steel imports from uh, Ukraine, and Ukraine has uh, stopped machinery exports uh, 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 to Russia. Uh, Ukraine has stopped buying gas from uh, uh, Russia because this was perceived as a means of war. Uh, Russia has effectively weaponized gas trade by using it as a means of corruption. They had a lovely agent called Dmitry Firtash, who got a massive loan of $11 billion from Gazprom Bank. And then he got cheap uh, uh, gas from Gazprom, and he could make the profit in Ukraine. And uh, the assessment is that he contributed about half a billion dollars to each of elections, 2010 and 2012, to uh, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. So, uh, to a considerable extent, Firtas bought Ukraine for Russia. That's why Ukraine cannot trade gas in normal terms. So this is a problem. Uh, and this has led to a decline in 17% uh, of GDP in uh, 2014 uh, to uh, 2015. But now the economy is recovering. And the question we are really posing is how fast uh, uh, is Ukraine ready? And then coming to your question, 40% of Ukraine's trade is now with Europe. It used to be a decade ago uh, only 10%. So th this has uh, sharply increased. And uh, the free trade agreement here contributes. I was uh, recently in, uh, in Lviv uh, two months ago. What a lovely place. And here you have a city which is the third uh, uh, high-tech hub. 
hub in um, in uh, Ukraine uh, around uh, Lviv, the new automotive uh, parts industry is growing up because the uh, uh, German and Japanese uh, car parts industry are moving from Central Europe towards Ukraine, to Western Ukraine. This is the big hope for the future. And in this area, there are no particular uh, problems with uh, 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 trade uh, obstacles. This is a free trade. And uh, that is the big hope. So you can say that what we expect to grow, agriculture, definitely. And uh, steel is uh, coming back. We should not uh, forget the steel. Steel and food are traditionally two thirds of Ukraine's exports. And uh, agriculture has now become much bigger than steel. Steel will be, uh, be less in, in the, uh, the future. The problem is that there are 36 import quotas in the uh, so-called free trade agreement. <coughs> And free trade agreements are never for free trade. So free, they are right? for regulated trade. Right. And, uh, but what is not there is uh, uh, the service, business services and um, manufacturing. This is where Ukraine should grow and where it can utilize the European market. Think of it. Lviv is just beside Poland. It's an open border. Uh, the salaries in Poland are five times higher in dollar terms than in Ukraine. Why not move some production over to Ukraine? It makes uh, no sense not to do it. And this is what these car parts uh, companies are uh, now st uh, starting uh, doing. And this should be uh, uh, the big hope uh, for the future. How about other markets? Uh, is the uh, American, Canadian, and so on markets are can be a future for Ukraine as well? Well, normally you trade most with those are uh, closest to you, mm -hmm. but uh, China is a big market for Ukraine, and the Middle East are because the Middle East is close. Uh, the Middle East imports lots of food mm -hmm. and has r a very, uh, a very few, uh, very little protection. You know, you can't really grow very much in the desert. So if you are in the desert, you need to import food from Ukraine. And um, for example, Egypt has uh, traditionally been a major importer from Ukraine and is now increasing. Uh, uh, was it two years ago that Ukraine overtook the US as the biggest exporter of corn to uh, China? Uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine is the seg second biggest exporter of arms to China after Russia, and which is probably one reason why China is persistently voting for money for Ukraine in the International Mo Monetary Fund. So China is very positive on, uh, on Ukraine, and this is also a question, will China invest in, uh, in Ukraine? There are considerable problems with legacy uh, agreements from uh, uh, Yanukovych, which uh, are considered uh, very messy in so many uh, ways uh, between China and uh, Ukraine, that that is blocking it, but this uh, should uh, be eased. Um, but uh, coming back to what are the main problems with investment in uh, Ukraine, I would say two things. One is uh, the war. I would uh, put it slightly different uh, here. Uh, of course, you, you have unpredictabilities uh, in the policy when you are changing the policy, because the policies need to be changed. So it's true that it's uh, uh, shaking up, but uh, the big problem is that how can you tell a big U.S. company, we want to invest in, uh, in Ukraine, and they say, sorry, haven't you noticed that there is war in your country? <laughs> And then to say, but I'm in Lviv, and this is 100 miles away that there is war. It's not necessarily a, a, an argument that would go down very well in headquarters here in the, uh, the US. Uh, <coughs> but uh, I think, uh, therefore, any kind of stabilization of the war situation is important. The other is the big uh, problem in the whole of the former Soviet Union, property rights. And um, both... Um, both uh, Paula and Betsy talked extensively about the problem with uh, property rights. You need a court system that functions. 
-hmm. If you look upon Russia, we are no property rights in Russia. Uh, we have now seen that Bashneft, for example, was renationalized because Rosneft CEO Sechin wants it. So first it's renationalized after it has been too successful. And uh, then it is privatized to the benefit of a state company, uh, Ros uh, Rosneft. So, uh, uh, and who loses money? The former uh, owner of Bashneft. Uh, went from $10 billion to $1 billion in assessed value by uh, uh, Forbes, uh, Vladimir Yevtoshenkov. And uh, the problem is that if you have corrupt courts, anybody can buy the court. And uh, Ukraine has now gone through a big judicial reform. The problem was that the, uh, <coughs> the High uh, Council, uh, Judicial Council of Justice was not uh, kept out of it, and it represents the old uh, 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 lawyers, and they don't want too much reform. So one quarter of uh, uh, new Supreme Court judges have not passed uh, uh, the uh, verification of their integrity. And uh, th that's a problem. What do you do in this situation? As uh, Paula talked about, you want an anti-corruption court an independent anti-corruption court. This has functioned very well in Romania, and this is what the EU is pushing for now. And uh, I do think that this will happen. And the reason is, um, uh, 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 Betsy talked about uh, how uh, uh, policy is done in stovepipes, but I would give you another picture. Uh, Ukraine today has an extremely strong civil society. You have organizations that are doing all kinds of expert job and digging it out. But, uh, no place is so transparent and at the same time so corrupt as Ukraine. So either side will win, either transparency <laughs> and, or corruption. Normally transparency wins. And I think that will happen in Ukraine. And the civil society thrives on and represents uh, this uh, transparency which you, you can read everything in, in the media. You can know exactly what is going on. Uh, the Ukrainian internet is very, uh, very good indeed, if you know where to look. Mm. Ukrainska Pravda is my main uh, source. And uh, <coughs> then after this, you have about 60 excellent parliamentarians who are really standing up uh, fighting for it. And m most of them are about 35. Many of them are lawyers and uh, all of them are professionals, all of them speak English. So th they represent a strong body, and then say that half of government is okay. And uh, then you have the Western community that is really engaged in Ukraine. So uh, if we go back to Saakashvili's reforms in Georgia, the US under Bush was strongly in favor of them. Uh, the EU was by and large against. Today we are seeing something completely different. All the international bodies have the same view, support the same reforms, and they are pushing together because the civil society and the transparency are so strong. So therefore we are seeing a good analysis. That's why I think that they will win, because the West has a substantial leverage. And what is needed here is money. If you have a little foreign direct investment, you need, this is a market failure because there's not confidence. Who should come in then? The government. The government in this case is represented by the international financial institution. The IMF has done its job. Now it's time for the other international organizations to do their job. The World Bank, that can't get the money out of the door. The EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, the European Investment Bank and uh, the International Financial Corporation, and all of these uh, bilateral export agencies and export credit agencies. It should easily raise $5 billion each year. That's 5% of GDP in, uh, for, uh, for Ukraine. This is what needs to happen now. It's the investment uh, uh, credits that, uh, that uh, uh, should uh, uh, come in and give the confidence, and then we'll see all the private investment uh, happening when uh, the public uh, funds are coming through. Paula, yes. May, may I circle back to my opening mm -hmm. comments because of looking at the security situation, the political situation. I had two points. 
One, I wanted to underscore, I think Anders is right in his definition of aggression. I focus predominantly on the physical aggression in eastern Ukraine. But I think you were very right to point out that that aggression, the scale and the scope, from Moscow goes beyond. You're, you mentioned quite rightly the sanctions imposed on Ukraine, which strangulates its own economic growth, shifts, as you pointed out, the market and the uh, you know some of the benefits that had been accrued. So I wanted first to say I, I think your point is well taken. Um, I, I I certainly do think, and I stand by my you know original point and agree with you. I do think the war has a destabilizing impact because investors, you're an exception in this, but investors, I think from the outside coming in, are going to be wary. Uh, even if you're a model, as you, you know, and you're trying to provide an incentive, which is a good thing, but I think that uh, in terms of the way that particularly, if I could say Western businesses, for example, I think they'll have that wariness because of the fears and especially with the ebbs and flows, as I pointed out, of the ceasefires. That a ceasefire is made, and then you know there are these agreements and reconciliations supposedly on track, and then we know there were violations consistently in this area. But the second point that I, I wanted to, to make was something that actually I mentioned uh, Groisman's uh, interview up in Canada. And I wanted to put this in, because it's not something any of us mentioned, and it is important to mention. He injected in, uh, when the questions asked about what could also be done to promote investment, he said, please, uh, for Canada and the United States, our request for lethal defensive weapons is still on the table. And why does that matter? Because he is arguing, give us that ability, because we want to be able to stabilize the situation. We want to be able to counter the situation in, in the eastern border. So I felt that that was important to put in here because it's, it's, it's an interesting dimension that he himself had uh, put on the table in front of the businessmen and women who had been assembled. And that is on the table. President yes, Trump, and right? it is on the table, correct. And it's something that we hope that there is a decision, and I think he was right to put it on the table, and that there should be a positive response to that. Thank request. you so much, and I would open, obviously, <laughs> to, uh, to this to, to the audience. So we have a representative from Ukrainian government. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I think, you know, would like to thank Atlantic Council first for, you know, bringing up this uh, issue to the general discussion. It's very timely to talk about investment in Ukraine. Uh, I'll give a few brief remarks just what, about what, said, uh, what was said and about a few remarks as I'm, I'm the head of economic office at the embassy. So I'll give a few kind of like remarks of what we see in terms of US-Ukraine relations and investments and what, what's happening here. So with regards to, I think, you know, uh, what Ambassador Paul Dabransky said, and uh, thank you very much for bringing up to the attention of the audience the remarks that Prime Minister said in Canada. So a, a lot of things are, you know, that we're discussing today he touched upon in, in his interview there. Um, with regards to the uh, IPR elephant, we, you know, we talk with Patsy regularly on this issue. And uh, just wanted to, for the broader audience, just to mention that things are changing. It's a long issue. It's, long, it's a historic problem uh, in Ukraine, not just in Ukraine, but in Ukraine as well. Um, apart from what's been mentioned, that uh, the new law being introduced on cinematography that addresses the IPR rights. Just less than a month ago, the president established with its, uh, his degree uh, um, a special court on IPR. So also new things happening in Ukraine that have never been done before. And uh, I'm confident that when we'll have a specialized office within the Ministry of uh, Economy devoted uh, particularly to IPR issues, things will be moving faster. Uh, with regards to a representative of uh, Burisma, I just wanted to say that you've mentioned two companies, big US companies, leaving Ukraine in 10, 11, or f entering and then leaving. So it doesn't have, it, 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 it I'm not, I cannot speak on behalf of the companies, of course, but just knowing the issue, they uh, did not leave uh, Ukraine because of uh, royalties uh, change uh, and, and the tax system. Uh, you can look what you know the general strategy was, and they were reassessing their strategy for the whole region 
and for the neighboring countries as well. And since I've mentioned royalties, yes, that's right. They were they were kind of like being uh, you know uh, higher in uh, 2014. It was a temporary measure because the government needed badly resources for the budget with the Russian aggression. Uh, but since then, I mean, the people who follow <coughs> this issue know that the issue has been readjusted and the royalties are much smaller right now than they were in 2014. So uh, maybe a few things about how we see it um, here at the embassy uh, in terms of U.S.-Ukraine relations. You know, I just wanted to say that, you know, we, we talk a lot to U.S. businesses uh, who want to invest in Ukraine and uh, all who already are in Ukraine. And I can tell you what's, what's new, what's the difference. You know, for the past, like, I think, you know, maybe two years, uh, we, we, were talk we were talking a lot about, you know, issues and problems they had in Ukraine. What's changing? Now we're talking about more about uh, projects, about new things they want to do in Ukraine. Less about uh, problems, much less. For example, you know, problem of VAT was one of the biggest issues for many, many years in Ukraine. Now we don't talk about that because it's done in an automatic way. So uh, the trade with the uh, U.S. is picking up. And the uh, Atlantic Council had a separate event on that where we discussed it more thoroughly. But I can tell you that the latest statistics for this year shows that the trade with U.S. Uh, and Ukraine is uh, more for, for, what, for eight months than it used to be for the whole previous year. And investments are growing uh, as well. It's difficult to count investments because usually they're, you know, like the projects, and uh, until the, you know, final, you, you, you don't see them on the statistics. But uh, where I could, uh, you know, point out, look at what overseas and private investment corporation is doing. This is the government, uh, U.S. government agency, whose uh, one of the main goals is to support uh, U.S. investments overseas. And if you look at their portfolio in Ukraine, it's close to one billion of projects in their pipeline, and, it, and it's growing. And we see a lot of interest from U.S. companies to do business in Ukraine and to invest in different sectors. In agriculture, it's been traditional, but what's new, it's uh, IT and it's infrastructure, and it's all connected. And we have a lot of new projects in aviation, in agriculture, and in infrastructure. So, you know, things are changing, and uh, we hope that, you know, with all the new reforms being introduced, there'll be much better climate for the further investments in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, we have questions. <laughs> um, Yura, please, identify yourself. Uh, <clears throat> George Sayevich, uh, Voice of America, retired. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you started, uh, Miroslava, you started with the uh, uh, wonderful news about the arrest of Alexander uh, Avakov as uh, in being something really encouraging uh, and also the extradition of the official, Ukrainian official from uh, Panama. But it could be uh, quite the opposite. If it is indeed uh, a real arrest in order to, let's say, clip the wings of Arsene Avakov, perhaps the most powerful uh, man in Ukraine, uh, that would be a great sign. But considering that the uh, amounts involved are a pittance, I think half a million in case of Alexander, uh, and I think seven million in case of the official extradited, uh, and also the probability that the fall guy will be the uh, former deputy minister, I think, I feel that it's much more likely that this is the Ukrainian government doubling down and giving us smoke, more of the smoke screen and more of the imitation of reform and fight, of, fight against corruption. Uh, so my question is, what other strong indications do you have or any other member of the panel has to give us an idea which way the wind is blowing, which way is the US, uh, Ukrainian government uh, going? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to respond. Uh, this arrest uh, by the son of uh, uh, Arsene Abak of the Minister of Interior was carried out by the National uh, Anti Corruption Bureau, uh, NABU, which is the correspondence to FBI in Ukraine, which has about 700 officers. The head of it, Artyom Sitnik, was uh, uh, 
selected by an Italian judge. It was a competition with uh, uh, more than 100 candidates who applied for the job. And uh, uh, Sitnik won. Uh, I know him. I think very highly of him. And what he has, uh, uh, he started as you need to do if you're fighting corruption. He asked for 120 special forces and three tanks. And then he went and uh, arrested people in the general prosecutor's office, which was not very popular with the general prosecutor. So they uh, tried to arrest people from uh, NABU instead. Uh, foreign specialists thought that it was uh, somewhat over the top, but it suggested considerable uh, integrity. And uh, NABU has continued like that, that they go for real uh, uh, culprits at a high level, uh, and uh, uh, they arrested, for example, Raman Nasirov, the head of the uh, state uh, fiscal uh, service, and have generally shown themselves, as far as I uh, can see, to be of great integrity. And at the same time, there was, uh, as uh, Dabo was created, uh, in a similar fashion. Um, <coughs> Uh, anti-corruption uh, prosecutor was appointed and he has also proven uh, quite good. The problem is the next step. There's no anti-corruption court. And the, uh, the really corrupt people, they normally have enough money so that they can buy the court and over, uh, manipulate it uh, in various ways. There are many special uh, techniques on how to uh, uh, manipulate the courts. That's the big problem. So we have two steps with the investigative arm and the prosecutor. We need a court that is reliable. That's why the West is not adamant that there has to be an anti-corruption court. And the IMF, listening to uh, civil society in Ukraine, has now made anti-corruption an independent uh, corruption court an absolute condition for a next tranche. If I may just yes. jump in to say, because your question was which way is the wind blowing, just to pick up on the last point, in my own remarks I mentioned that when Groisman referenced that he's laying down a marker that he wants to see that anti-corruption court be independent, that no longer should uh, uh, these judgments be made by those who are influencing or manipulating um, uh, outcomes of financial investigations, that it has to be clean. But the question will be, there is a debate, there is a law, uh, there's you know, a law that's now, and uh, uh, as I understand it, that's before uh, uh, U Ukraine, uh, and we will see what direction it goes in. But at least, I will say he publicly, in his case, he laid down a marker that it should be independent and that's the way that enforcement should be going. Why I say that it's positive news, that it's, you have to start somewhere. And even at least those arrests is the sign, some kind of sign that something moving ahead. And we will see how it ends, but it's important to, to make that first step if you take that reference about the elephant and, and how you <laughs> eat the elephant. Start somewhere. So <laughs> I, yes, please, with the elephant. Could you identify yourself? Oh. Yeah, thank you very much. I'd like to ask something much more pedestrian than that, and that is uh, uh, this gentleman on the right. What do you think the prospects for offshore oil, gas, offshore Ukraine? Uh, do you see uh, Ukraine and Romania having some common interests in that area? And is the situation in Crimea a problem for offshore uh, oil and gas uh, activities? Uh, first of all, Ukraine, uh, uh, Black Sea territory, is a huge potential for offshore exploration. And Ukraine as a state had its own uh, drilling uh, stations there, drilling rigs, uh, and it was quite successful. But now all of that property uh, unlawfully uh, was taken by Russians. And now that uh, offshore gas and oil goes to Russian pipelines and oil, uh, and oil pipe, uh, pipelines. Uh, but in terms of generally Ukraine, the biggest potential was actually on the Black Sea Shelf. If you would uh, 
if you would compare onshore and offshore. So this is first thing. Uh, unfortunately, Romania was never our ally in that uh, issue, and Ukraine even had its disputes with Romania regarding the certain territories. Um, so I don't know about the position now, but uh, until Russians are there, I think that our prospects are quite distant from the reality, unfortunately. Thank you. Please. Hi, my name is Ted Kondik. I, I wanted to return to the issue of IPR and ask the question whether our government is not uh, focusing too much on sticks and not on carrots in terms of IPR. I'll draw the analogy to the CD piracy issue. I was at the State Department at the desk, and the CD piracy was a big issue in Ukraine at the time, and we identified four factories that were producing hundreds of millions of illegal CDs, and not just for the Ukrainian market, for the Western European market. We leaned on the Ukrainian government to shut them down, and they did eventually. And the pirates basically came back with an offer saying, well, we want to go legit. Why don't you give us licensing agreements? Let us produce these CDs. You can export them to your markets, and we can sell them at a rate that's affordable to Ukrainians. And the recording industry, our recording industry said, no, we just want you to shut down, and you want, we want you, your people to pay rates that are just simply unattainable for the Ukrainian population. So I want to draw the analogy to the IPR uh, software issue. At two, three hundred dollars for a software package, how many Ukrainians can afford uh, uh, Microsoft Office? Are we uh, trying to encourage our software vendors to offer enter enterprise licensing that includes uh, licenses for private machines of employees at nominal fees like we do here in the United States? I was able to buy Microsoft Office for ten dollars under the State Department license. And I don't know if anything like that is available or offered in Ukraine. Are we asking Microsoft to go into partnership agreements with hardware retailers to bundle hardware and software to make these products affordable legitimately to the Ukrainian population? Or are we only focusing on trying to enforce monopolistic sales? Um. <laughs> no. <laughs> I can tell you right now, no, we are not trying to encourage monopolistic sales. Uh, no, we certainly have uh, talked with our private sector companies here on, on our side of the issue and encouraged them to work with the government of Ukraine to come to a mutually acceptable resolution. We are not going to dictate the terms to those. We have encouraged both sides, but we have left it to them. It's a commercial deal. and. The U.S. government doesn't dictate terms of commercial deals. And so, um, I mean, I, I take your point, but that's, uh, there's only so far that we can go. So we have, we've encouraged discussions, but at the same time, they are using something. They're, they need to be licensed. They need to some kind of come to some kind of a resolution. And so we have encouraged both sides to talk and to come to something. But at the end of the day, the commercial deal is to be made between the two commercial players. But it's ironic given that Dmitry Shimkiv, the former CEO of Microsoft, is now the chief economic reformer in Parashenko's office and deputy chief of staff. It, what does that hang together? It, <laughs> it is, and he is, I mean, and he, so he sees both sides of it, and it's, he's somebody that we talk to quite frequently about it. <laughs> I just introduced him yesterday in the yeah. morning. <laughs> uh, so please, um, any question? Uh, Yura, maybe somebody else will go back to you. Yes, please. Hello, th thanks very much for your presentation. I'm Mikola Vorobyov with John Hopkins University. Uh, Andros, probably this is question will be for you because I read almost all your books and your <laughs> articles. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and really try to find an answer on key question about Ukraine and what, what is this conversation is about. The key problem, I believe that this is the oligarchy. So basically, despite two revolutions, uh, uh, Orange and Yevromaidan revolution, these reforms, mm -hmm. the civil society is also very strong, and you know, I also representative of this civil society in Ukraine. But basically, the key problem is, uh, uh, is oligarchs uh, are oligarchs who stand behind all the key decisions in the country. So they are in uh, key, uh, um, say, in, in key business, they own politicians and so forth. So basically, unless we uh, will fix this issue, 
I doubt we can build a strong European country. So what do you think? And, but on the other hand, we don't have another strong institutions which could replace oligarchs somehow. So this is a paradox. So between, I mean, they own the country literally, but on the other hand, we don't have anything else just instead to offer. So what's, what's your, from economical or political perspectives, what do you think? And of course, uh, other panelists, thank you very much. Yeah, I very much agree with what uh, Paula said here uh, before, that it's demonopolization uh, that is uh, important. You have two terms, demonopolization and de oligarchization. I much prefer demonopolization. The strong institution that can beat uh, oligarchs is market. It's not the state in the form of renationalization. Uh, uh, after the Orange Revolution, the dominant idea was renationalization, or reprivatization, as uh, they call it. This was what Julia Timoshenko in particular drove, but also <coughs> Yushchenko uh, pushed it. That was the big mistake of uh, the Orange uh, Revolution in terms of economic uh, uh, policy. Uh, so just to open the market, uh, oligarchs don't make uh, uh, money on the market, they make um, money on monopolies. Abolish the monopolies, open up the markets in all ways. If you take, for example, Firtas still controls the obl uh, oblast gas uh, uh, trade and has possibilities of making money when he's sitting in Vienna on this. Just abolish this uh, oblast uh, uh, monopolies. They shouldn't be there. It should be a free trade of uh, uh, gas uh, uh, and <coughs> It's a, a similar situation in a lot of other areas. There's a lot of uh, complaints about how the electricity, non-market uh, functions. I don't quite understand it, but uh, it's obvious that it's not a market. So gas and the electricity markets, if they are re re really established, that would ease up. When I left uh, Kiev last, I counted that there were 22 airplanes ready to leave. Uh, 20 of them belong to Kalamoyski, and two of them were co-chaired by Kalamoyski. <laughs> so there was not one airplane leaving Kiev uh, at that time that was not controlled by uh, Kal Kalamoyski. And Kalamoyski is then the person who makes sure that um, low-cost airplanes can't not land coming. in Ukraine. And he fights for, uh, for that. So just to open up uh, the skies. But the means he's using is that he has uh, uh, the, the airports and airport authorities and uh, uh, people in the Ministry of Infrastructure that uh, 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 control it. Uh, but <coughs> I think that if you dislike oligarchs, the best way of uh, getting a perspective of them is uh, to go to Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> and there you see all <laughs> these grand cottages, as they were called, or uh, palaces of the robber barons, uh, or in particular of the Vanderbilts. <coughs> and uh, 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 in 1970, these houses were sold for 2% of the original value. They were uh, uh, more or less g given away because uh, the robber barons had lost their, their wealth. Essentially, uh, Newport, uh, Rhode Island was only thriving for a quarter of a century. It was one big investment boom, one big r uh, raw material boom. I think that uh, the uh, uh, oligarchs in Ukraine, it's essentially gas trade plus, uh, plus the raw material boom uh, from uh, 2000 uh, that is now over. So I don't think that the, uh, the oligarchs are the big problem. I think it's the state that is the big problem in Ukraine. And that you have people now sitting in uh, uh, par uh, parliament that are doing all kinds of funny business. Uh, we had this uh, protest, was it two weeks ago? Yeah, it's uh, still and there. there. Were three yeah. big quest uh, uh, demands they had all. One was anti-corruption court that we've talked about, but the other two concerned the parliament. One was a, a new electoral system which was in the coalition agreement of this uh, uh, government originally in December uh, 2014, and the other to abolish the immunity, uh, legal immunity of the parliamentarians, so that you can arrest the crooks. Now, uh, first the case is raised, 
when there is a vote in the parliament, if they should uh, uh, <coughs> uh, erase the immunity of one particular parliamentarian, and then that parliamentarian can have left the country, which is normally the case, for example, with Alexander Onyshenko. So it's these people are sitting in parliament, and uh, as Mustafa Naim complains, that they often pay three to five million dollars for their seat in these rotten boroughs that they are buying, and then of course they want to get return on their investment. So I look up on uh, parliamentarians, uh, uh, corrupt parliamentarians, uh, as uh, a big problem today for Ukraine uh, than, uh, than the, uh, the oligarchs. I would like to hear other panelists uh, on that topic and add to, I would like to add, like how do you see the, how, how do you, how it's possible to get rid of oligarchy in Ukraine? Uh, what to do with oligarch, oligarchs? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think I would agree with Anders. It's the market, maybe it's time, it's, um, I, I, I guess sort of part of my response was too, it's, it's going to be the Ukrainian people. It's going to be, I, I don't want to support the demonstrations that are going on, but it is it's the people who are going to get very tired of the corruption of the high prices, of the immunity, of those. And it's, I think that, as we've talked, they have taken steps. Um, I think that opening up their markets, opening up their borders, um, the signature of the association agreement with the EU and bringing some of those institutions in, I think that's what's going to to do to to move it move the needle in the way it should go and I, I probably should circle back to what I said before the transparency predictability and the rule of law reminding oligarchs that they are subject to the rule of law and the transparency I mean the the rule about at least the government having to file their um, financial information so it's a step you know, I mean um, so I think that those steps are going to help erode the power of the oligarchs. So should they be prosecutor? Or should they be given amnesty? How do you deal with oligarchs? Well, I already had mentioned in my comments, as Anders mentioned, you know, the fact with privatization is key mm -hmm. to uh, 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 the bolstering the economy, but fair privatization. And so there has to be a yeah. demonopolization. I thought it was interesting, Anders' analogy, because I happen to be just up in Newport, Rhode Island, <laughs> and saw the, the Vander, saw the Vanderbilt, the Breakers, <laughs> Marble House, um, the different places. But you know what's interesting, and injecting this, also it's worth injecting because you made that historical kind of, you know, uh, go looking back at, at uh, those families. Uh, one of the family members, there's a house at the end of uh, the Bellevue Avenue, and it's called Rough Point, and Doris Duke was the one who held the house, and there's a Rhode Islander, in fact, sitting over there. Um, uh, why this is relevant, she committed a crime, and she was going to be in prison, but what the local government decided was they uh, basically uh, had, had said, in return for your freedom, you will refurbish this entire community. And she did. She put her monies to good use. So I think also here, part of it is how privatization goes forward, how everyone is integrated, and how monies are used for good use here. Mm -hmm. That's what I think um, matters in this, this outcome. Yes. Uh, let me add here, Ukrainian holdings abroad are probably $140 billion. Mm -hmm. Russian holdings abroad are 800 billion to, to one trillion dollars. Uh, because you can't keep money in these countries because you don't have property rights, so you have to mm -hmm. take out the money. And when you have taken them out, they get locked. We saw in Cyprus when there was financial crisis, very little money got out of Cyprus, although it was quite obvious that there would be a bank collapse. And why? Because uh, uh, people couldn't move the money. 
and this money uh, should then be activated and how does it get activated by not by pro uh, prohibitions but uh, by legalization so uh, what one really wants to avoid is nationalization because the state can't manage what it has and it would it take over more the economy would function uh, worse and uh, let the market uh, take care of uh, uh, of the redistribution uh, of wealth these people who have made money uh, uh, on the state are not likely to be able to make money on the market that a totally different function so i believe in the market i also think privatization demonopolization and also political will is required yes. to advance this i think it's a perfect ending of this uh beautiful discussion. I see now questions, but we are, we are like three minutes. I probably would give you a chance, like uh, you, 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 yes. Bob. Uh, Bob. Uh, hi, my name is Robert Homans. I'm a part-time resident of Ukraine. Um, Anders, you mentioned um, the wage differential between uh, Poland and Ukraine, and now there's a uh, visa-free regime, and you have a lot of people, uh, especially young people, uh, essentially voting with her feet. Um, my stepdaughter and her boyfriend are among them. Um, do you see this as a long-run problem for the Ukrainian economy? And or do you see these people who have voted with their feet to be a uh, influence of reform in the future of Ukraine? Uh, both, but mainly positive. Uh, in Poland today, there are 1.4 million Ukrainians who have uh, uh, work permits and then probably at least 10,000 Ukrainian students uh, in Poland. So uh, uh, Poland makes a, a major contribution to the education of uh, Ukrainians and many uh, people come back, even in, uh, in this country, Half of the immigrants over history uh, have returned to their home countries. And the U.S. has probably a larger share of people who have stayed in the country than uh, other immigration uh, countries. And uh, if you take poor countries, uh, uh, they get massive remittances. For Ukraine, gets very big remittances, uh, as it is uh, uh, now. Uh, and... Um, uh, immigration countries normally uh, become immigration uh, countries when they have developed. Uh, we have seen most European countries uh, had uh, each had uh, their period of massive uh, immigration and uh, eventually they took off. Admittedly, we have Ireland that was an immigration country from 1847 to 1990, so that was a rather long period. But uh, in most countries it was uh, uh, 10, 20 years of uh, big immigration and then they uh, uh, caught up. Uh, but uh, if you take uh, normal European countries, it was about a quarter of the population that, uh, that emigrated to the United States at one time uh, or, or the other. So there will be massive movements. Ukraine used to have 52 million people in uh, uh, 89. <coughs> Officially, there are now 46 million. In reality, it's probably 40 million because uh, 6 million or so have emigrated uh, uh, quietly. So, only the Edisha Grant countries, there are uh, probably 3 million Ukrainians. I, just, I, I want to add, because I agree with Oslin that it's a positive, I think it's the latter of the two scenarios that were presented because. When after we were in Ukraine, we went down to Moldova, and we were was talking with somebody there who was observing about sort of the atmosphere in Chisinau as opposed to Kiev, and pointing out that a very large percentage of Moldovans can get Romanian passports, which means they are EU citizens in essence. So they can leave, and they have a much greater opportunity in the EU. With Ukraine, yes, it's a visa-free regime, they can get work permits, but they're not citizens. And so I think that there is, um, I don't want to say they have to go back, because in deference to my colleagues from Ukraine, you don't have to go back to a good place. And I think it is a good place, but I think that, I mean, I have always been struck by the tremendous sense of hope and inspiration in Kyiv 
compared to some other countries in the region that mm -hmm. I visited. And I think, and when somebody pointed out to me the sort of that reality, I was like, well, yeah, I guess that, that sort of makes sense. And so I think that a lot of, you know, Ukrainians clearly are leaving, but I think there's still a strong pull back and they are not, and unlike the Moldovans, for example, they cannot be integrated as thoroughly and easily into the EU. Yeah. Last word. Yeah, last word. Thanks. Since we've got investment conference, yeah. <laughs> so I would like to to, uh, to have an opportunity to finish um, our conversation uh, talking about investments. And although um, and although I started with certain criticism regarding the governmental measures that they used to take a few years ago, today I got to give credit uh, to the current government because what are the positive developments? And if there were potential investors here, what I would convey to them. So first, uh, governments, uh, government do, uh, does listen to trade associations. They started to do that. That never happened before. Mm -hmm. that, that, that I have to admit. Uh, the government became more predictable, at least in our sphere, in oil and gas. And as a result of that, most of the oil and gas companies uh, increased their investment programs this year. It's nearly doubled than the last year. Only our company, we had written 20 new wells this year. Um, other companies uh, try to copy us, not as many as we, but they're doing their best. And, um, and, that's, and also, I uh, have to say, uh, you know, we've discussed today and mentioned a few times Prime Minister Groisman, he personally uh, pays his attention to oil and gas industry. Uh, he talks to the marketplace and it was very well no noticed. And, you know, so overall, I would say that the trend is becoming positive. Fantastic. <laughs> Glass is half full. Yes. Thank you so much. Maybe. Yes. Uh, one thing, I, I always like to correct my mistakes. Uh, if you enjoy today's investment conference, which I think you probably did, we had a wonderful set of speakers, I should point out that this is brought to you by the Atlantic Council's partnership with Burisma. This has made this event possible. So, so thanks to Burisma for this and to our speakers for a wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.